Um, so what's on the menu? As people pointed out to me, you can order things from a menu and you can create the joke from this if you want. Uh, here's what's happening. Um, I'm going to start talking about moving class groups um, of finite type, which is my first love, uh, regardless of what you might think of me. Uh, then we're going to talk about moving and results uh, and results you Maxine Wolf, a really nice, beautiful result. Uh, and then we'll talk about the main theorem of Martin Adams and a bunch of fun corollary to get out of it. Uh, this theorem was described as embarrassingly elementary, I think by Adam or maybe the referee, I can't remember. <laughs> One of the it's like a high chance of reference in the audience as well. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go. So let's start off with wrapping class groups. They were briefly hinted at in Jonathan's talk. Uh, so first, here sigma. I'm going to have use this notation. All right, so this here is um, an orientable uh, finite type. It's nice that we have to say this to get, uh, from one point of view, and it's really annoying when you're actually just talking about finite type surfaces to have to keep saying it. Uh, orientable finite type surface uh, of genus G. With n punctures and b boundary components. Okay, so the superscript is the boundary components. Subscript is the punctures. All right, um, and so you know, for example, this is clusters of punctures. So this is um, you know sigma. The genus is one. There's two punctures and two boundary components. Okay, great. Cool. The mapping class group. So um, the mapping class group of a surface is the group of homeomorphisms, orientation-preserving ones, all right, of the isotopy. And we note that isotopies and homeomorphisms, so isotopies and homeos must fix uh, the boundary pointwise. Okay. Right. So I mean, you know, the homeomorphism group of a surface is a really great group to think about, but it's also very hard. So when you might have by isotopy, this group becomes um, a little nicer. When you're a finite type surface, this is a finitely generated, finitely presented group. Uh, it's nice and discrete and everything else. Okay. So let's have a look at some elements of the mapping class group. These are called mapping classes. So you could take a genus three surface with one puncture and you can rotate, right? Two pi on three. So this is an element in the mapping class group of sigma do with three, genus three, one puncture. So that's something you can do. Here are some other examples of elements. So let's take a genus two surface with one boundary component. We can pick our favorite simple closed curve on our surface. Here's mine. That's not true. Mine, my favorite is the one around the boundary component, but for now we'll just use this one. Uh, let's call it alpha. And I'm gonna perform a day twist around alpha, which we're going to call T alpha. Okay. And it's going to do something to the surface. What's it going to do to the surface? Right. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what it does by showing you what it does to this curve here, which intersects alpha. Right. And it sends this curve. It hits alpha and then wraps around once. So maybe you want to think about it as you cut along alpha rotate one of the sides by 360 degrees and glue it back together. Or you cut out a little annulus, do the one non-trivial sort of one twist on one boundary component and then glue it back in. Okay. However you want to think about it. This is called a day twist about alpha. So this is an element of the mapping class group of 
Here we have sigma two with one boundary components there. Uh, this is called a Dane twist about alpha. Dane twist about alpha. It's an infinite order element um, and mapping class groups. Are, these are very important elements in mapping class groups. They're generated by them um, in particular, which is nice. You know, it's kind of remarkable that they're generated by Dane twists because you look at this homeomorphism here, which is a very rigid finite order thing, and you're like, no way. But you can decompose that as a product of Dane twists. If you're bored already, which is pretty rough, but <laughs> you can try to try this as a product of Dane twists. Great. All right, so what are some examples of mapping class groups? Um, let's take the mapping class group of a disk. So this is zero and one boundary component, and this is trivial. <laughs> That's an exercise. It's something called the Alexander trick. There's a very neat little argument. You can show that any homeomorphism of the disk that fixes the boundary component point-wise has to be isotopic to the identity. Um, let's look at the mapping class group of a disk but punctured n times, and this is uh, the braid group, the n, uh, the braid group. We saw this appear in Jonathan's talk, braid group on n strands. So let me just give, in case you haven't seen this before, let me try to give you an idea as to why this is actually the braid group. So you take a, so here's, here's where the isomorphism comes from, where I'm thinking of the definition of the braid group as the strands, right? You take these diagrams as strands and then concatenate strands. Um, so you can take a non-trivial homeomorphism of this disk, and maybe it permutes the punctures and does some other things. But we know that the mapping class group of the disk without any punctures is the identity. So that means every homeomorphism is isotopic to the identity if you were allowed to move the punctures around. So now you perform your homeomorphism and now you just play the movie of what's the isotopy that takes that homeomorphism back to the identity. And while you're playing the movie, those punctures are gonna move around. Yeah, that's, the, that's the isomorphism to the break group. Very beautiful little picture. Okay, cool. Any questions? We have reached the first part of the menu. That's great. Oh. <laughs> It'll be all kinds of fun. All right, orderability. Let's go to section two. Let's talk about orderability of these groups. Let's start with left orderability, actually. Left orderability. Okay. So for what's going to be true is that, or well, what is true, is that um, mapping class groups where the boundary is non-empty are left orderable. Okay. So... If your boundary is not empty, your left order rule, and I'm going to give you an example of how this arises uh, with the braid group, in fact. I have one way you can construct orders, and then I'll just wave my hands for all the rest of the cases. All right, so let's take the example of the braid group. You want not equal to... Sorry? Yeah. Just testing. All right. <laughs> Dale took the red eye here and he still picked it up before the rest of you. <laughs> okay, so here's a very neat way to order the braid group, the left order the braid group. You look at this set of arcs. Okay. So imagine the punctures are marked points if you want. By the way, this, this is due to, let me write down who it's due to, this little argument. Um, Van, Green, Rolfson, he had an unfair advantage. He, he knew it was not empty. Okay. I'll see. Uh, Roar and Weist, uh, IE. Okay. Um, so it was known before these five people uh, by Darren Watt that the brain group was left orderable, but the argument I'm going to give is due to. Um, okay, so what you do is you enumerate you enumerate these arcs. So I'm going to enumerate them as like one, two, three. You go from left to right, and you look at some element of the braid group. So it does something to these arcs. 
if there's something to these arcs, I mean, I'll go at two different ones. Maybe there's one that goes like this, this, and then that. Uh, and let's have a look at a different one. I'm going to go like this, and then I want to go to right. So here's how you decide what's in the positive cone and what's not, is you just walk along your arcs one at a time, and the first time your arc moves, it's going to either move to the left or the right. Okay? The first arc that is not equal to where it started from, right? So here, the first arc that moves is the first one, and it moves to the left. So this is what's called a left veering braid. This is left veering. And this one, the first arc doesn't move anywhere, but then the second one moves to the right. So this is right veering, right moving, tells you exactly what's happening. And all of these ones are going to be in the positive cone. All of these ones are going to be in the inverse of the positive cone. And this gives you um, a left ordering on the braid group. It's a really beautiful little picture. And more importantly, it tells you what's going to be true for mapping class groups in general. That's not where I would have put the TV. Okay. There is the eraser. Did I miss the eraser somewhere? Oh, thank you. Thank you. So in general, so let's say I had a surface like that. I'm going to take a set of arcs which fill the surface. So that means when you cut along them, you're just left with a disk. Here's some. Uh, there's one. There's one. Uh, and that will not quite do it. I'll put that one there too. And you will make them play the same game. Great. Which one goes to the left first? And that exactly gives you a positive count. Okay, on the mapping class group. So you might let uh, P as a subgroup, it's a mapping class group of sigma um, be the set of left veering mapping classes. Great, and I'm just gonna advertise an open question that came up during the problem session last week. So here's an open question is that, um, so suppose uh, you had no boundary. Is there a finite index subgroup that is left orderable? Subgroup of MCG. Okay, great. I'm not going to talk about that question. I just wanted to advertise it. Yes. The enumeration is important. I'm, I'm sorry? It's the enumeration one. Enumeration. If you enumerate differently, you get a different left ordering. Um, we we'll always have to remember one, the one with the boundary. Oh, for this, for the, yeah, I was being a bit sloppy here. Over here, it doesn't matter okay. because everything's hitting the boundary, but yes, you want to look at the first one being the one on the boundary. Okay, great. So that was left orderability. Let's talk about circular orderability of mapping class groups. All right. Let's bigger punctures with this picture. You can take punctures with this picture. That's fine. When I'm talking about going left and going right, there in the background there's some choice of a metric, and you have to make sure that your your um your arcs are tight in some sense, right? But then I just want to give you a basic idea as to how it works. Uh, okay, there is circular orderability. Uh, I'm going to give you two ways to circularly order some mapping class groups. Right. One. Actually, so MCG. So what's what's true is that the mapping class group of a genus G surface with one puncture is circularly orderable. Right? If it has boundary, it's left orderable, so it's circularly orderable. But um, you know, what about the ones without boundary? And um, the ones with one puncture are. And let me sketch out why this is true. So. Uh, at least in two different ways. So let's take a genus two surface with a puncture. And I'm going to pick a base point. Now, please, Robert. I'm going to pick a base point and look at a little curve, a little loop in the fundamental group around the puncture. And right, let's call this W. So W is some cyclic subgroup of pi one 
of your surface. So it corresponds to some cover. And as long as this surface is hyperbolic, that cover is also hyperbolic, right? And the cover looks like you've got your cusp, which is the cusp pattern uh, corresponding to this puncture. So here's where W is. W is still going to be wrapped around because it's a, it's a cover corresponding to W, so it stays wrapped up and everything else unwraps itself. Maybe you want to think of this as like the upper half plane model and you're modding out by just some parabolic element. Okay. So this thing becomes a cylinder, but you know, down at the bottom, it's very, the distances are very, very big and at the top, they're very, very small. And you can put a, um, so this is some cover. You can, you can look at the boundary of this cover in the same way you look at the boundary of hyperbolic space. You look at ray, uh, geodesic rays and um, if two stay a bounded distance apart, you associate them to the same component. So del sigma tilde is um, homeomorphic to S1. And you can show that every, every um, F in the mapping class group of sigma G1 lifts to sigma tilde, sigma hat. So this is what in the literature is called the conical cover of a surface with one isolated puncture. Great. And this gives rise to an action of sigma, a mapping class group of this on S1, on the boundary. So you take an element in mapping class group, you lift it as conical cover, and that gives you an action on the circle. And this is one way to see that this is secularly orderable. So what's the Euler class with that action? What's the Euler class? It's... Um, I mean, it's non-zero, it's a generator of H2. Uh, H2 of this group is Z cross Z. It's one of the generators. And in fact, every circular ordering, this is what Katie Mann and Maxine Wolf proved, which I'll get to in a sec, but I'll say it now, is that every circular ordering lives in that same cohomology class. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that's the first way you can see that this thing's circularly orderable. How else can you see it? Uh, so let's, the second way is to recall, if you have a left ordered group, right? Um, L, O, and Z in uh, G, co-final, central, uh, is co-final and central, then this is secondly orderable. Right? You can take the quotient by co-final central element and get that the, Resulting group is secularly orderable. Uh, and here's a suspiciously convenient short exact sequence, which comes handed to you when you learn about mapping class groups. It's called the capping homomorphism. So capping uh, looks like this. So one goes to Z goes to the mapping class group of a genus G surface with one boundary component to a mapping class group of a genus G surface with one puncture goes to one. And this map is called the capping homomorphism. So what's going on? Let me switch this and I'll draw a picture on the other side. Okay. So what's going on is that um, You've got a genus G surface with one boundary component. G equals two. Uh, and then you can sort of glue on a punctured disc onto that boundary component. Okay. And the kernel, so let's call a boundary component, uh, sorry, a curve isotopic to the boundary component D. Okay. Um, so T alpha is equal to the kernel, sorry, T B is equal to the kernel of the capping homomorphism. Remember when you're dealing with mapping class groups, uh, you have to keep the boundary fixed point wise. So when you take a day twist around the boundary, you can't untwist because the boundary is stuck there. But when you tap, suddenly you've got a puncture there and you can untwist any twisting that happens. So this dangerous becomes trivial when you include this surface into there. And you get this short exact sequence where here, 
This is exactly the subgroup generated by the Dane twist about the boundary component. And I say it's suspiciously convenient because if I take any of the orderings determined by choosing arcs going from my boundary component and then enumerating them, I can twist, I can always twist around a boundary component to make my arcs veer as far left as I want. And this exactly means that they're co-final. Right. So there is a left ordering here in which TD is co-final and it's always central. All right. um, that's just a fact from mapping task groups. Uh, so that tells me exactly that this is uh, circularly orderable. So since uh, TD is co-final, for some left ordering, um, let's go, and it's central. This exactly tells me that the map and task group of a once punctured surface is secularly orderable. Right. Any questions? So that's a little survey about orderability mapping class groups, at least of finite type ones. What if there's more than one? So let's say you had two punctures. You can line up your mapping class group um, so that you have a puncture. So you can line up the surface so that you have a puncture on either end. And then you can do like a hyperelliptic involution and another involution that switches them. And this will give you a dihedral subgroup. So it's not going to be circularly orderable because you get a Z2 cross Z2. And you can play similar games for more punctures. Yeah, any other questions? Mapping class groups are made for this world. Right. It's like so many things are really beautiful and convenient. Okay, so here's a nice theorem, a really wonderful theorem due to Katie Mann and Maxine Wolf. I wish I could change the order with this convention. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that row one and row two be two actions of the surface. Oh, I need G bigger than or equal to two. Oh, actually, I'll, well, I've just watched this line completely. Okay, let's start again. All right, so G greater than or equal to two. So let, uh, let's say you have two actions, row one and row two. From the mapping class group of sigma G1, central actions in the homeo plus one. So these groups are countable. So this is equivalent you know, to being secondly orderable. So we know that mapping class groups admit injections. Um, suppose you have any two of them, then they're basically the same. That's what they say. There's only really one interesting one from a dynamic perspective. All right. So the exact statement is that so then row one uh, and row two are what they call weakly conjugate, but what is usually called semi conjugate. Weakly conjugate, okay, which is usually referred to as semi conjugate. The reason they say weakly conjugate is because semi conjugate means something else in some other contexts. So they wanted to distinguish from those contexts. Okay. In topological dynamics, there's this little spiel at the beginning of their paper where they propose this and they hope it catches on. Anyway, what does this mean in terms of uh, actual circular orderings? So the way that I prefer to think about things. So this is true if and only if, so if you have two different circular orderings, F1 and F2, um, circular orderings on the mapping class group, sigma G1, um, then they're both, they belong to the same bounded cohomology class, F2, in H2B of your mapping class group. I'll just write H2B. Don't you have a possibility to change the range of the circle? 
Oh, yes, sure. Okay, so you can choose a different, right. But if we're in the orientation, you fix an orientation on the circle. Yeah, the actual, the, uh, you have two different actions. Okay. Then you change the orientation of the. Oh, right. And this corresponds to either your Dane twist being positive in the left. Yeah, okay. Okay, I agree. Great. Decide. Okay, great. Right. So one thing this tells you. Sorry, this is the definition of weekly from here. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's a semi conjugate, a weekly conjugate is like a, it's a dynamical, it's a relation where you have two representations and they're related by like collapsing intervals and conjugation. And then it follows that they have to live in the same bound and cohomology class. Sorry, so does the theorem begin after semi conjugate, finish after semi conjugate? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then there's yeah. An alternative. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is there any new white chalk around? Do you know if there's any full white chalk? Okay, it's fine. This got left with the dregs here. Okay, that's all right. I'll deal with it. Okay, so what does it tell you, right? So we know that any two circular orderings, at least up to sign, they belong to the same cohomology class. And a cohomology class, so they belong to the same cohomology class. So all circular orderings, all circular orderings give rise to this short exact sequence. And the up to sign just gives you whether or not you have the positive data as being positive in the left ordering or negative in the left ordering. Right? I think I've said the right thing now. <laughs> so all circular orderings give rise to this left ordered central extension. They give rise to any left order central extension, and it happens to be this one. It happens to be the one coming from the capping, capping homomorphism, which is very nice. And it tells you no other groups arise here. So a natural question is do all left orderings? Come from this as well, right? Are all left orderings on the mapping class group in the middle? Do they have the property that the Dane twist is, you know, central and co-final, which seems like a ridiculous thing to ask for, except that it's true. Okay, so here's the main theorem. You can Adam and myself. This is the embarrassingly elementary theorem. <laughs> okay. So the Dane twist around the boundary component. Is um is this co-final <laughs> less than co-final? I don't know how to say it. Uh, in every in every left ordering on the mapping class group of sigma with one boundary component, and you've got traces that's either positive or negative, but either way, it's going to be co-final. Right. Any questions about the statement? So then you're saying that twice in some That's exactly where we're going. Yeah. But before we go and apply something similar to what Penny and Maxine do, let's sketch out the proof. All right. So let's sketch out the proof. Um, the proof relies on the following lemma, which is a little exercise in orderable groups. Okay. And the lemma says the following. So if let G let G be left orderable um, and Z in G a central element. So conveniently, mapping class groups have central elements that they twist around a boundary component is central. Before I cramp up, I'm gonna change the green. Okay, let G be LO and that's central. And suppose that, so if G is generated, by roots of z, then z is co-final for every ordering for all uh, for all left orders. Right, so this is the little lemma you have to prove. Not terribly difficult. It's a fun little exercise. And now we can use this to sketch a proof of our theorem. <laughs> okay, so let's. Proof of the main theorem. 
Let's sketch it out. Uh, okay, so I'm going to draw very carefully a genus G surface with one boundary component. Dot, dot, dot. Right, there's lots of genus there. My office mate had an issue when I drew ellipses to indicate lots of genus. He just didn't like that. It's like, this is a ridiculous thing to do as a grad student. All right, and now I'm going to look at the following curves. So there's alpha one, there's alpha two, alpha three, alpha four, and then this one's going to be alpha two G. And over here, I'm going to look at B just for fun. Now I'm just going to state a bunch of facts from the world of mapping class groups, uh, almost all of which can basically be found in this book called The Primer on Mapping Class Groups. Uh, it's the thing I was made to read front to back when I started my PhD. Uh, so here are some nice facts, and you should too. Okay. So first is that the Dane tool from the boundary component, which I'm always going to call B, all right, that's central. And the reason this is true is because B is disjoint from every other, it can be realized disjointly from every other simple closed curve on your surface. Okay. So that's central. Um, what other facts do I need? So all then twists about non-separating simple closed curves. That's what that means. Non-separating simple closed curves are so they are conjugate. Here is a fact due to Humphreys is that the mapping class group simply D1 um, is generated by those curves I drew there. The dangerous about those, sorry. T alpha one up to T alpha two G and T V. So the second fact that you call positive dangerous. The second fact, all yes, positive dangerous. So there's a certain orientation. I'm always switching left. Like if I if I walk toward the curve myself, I'm a day twisting about it, I get forced left. So that's always doing the same direction. Okay, all day twists about not separating curves is a conjugate. Humphrey tells you that's true. And then you have these wonderful little relations to alpha to g to the power to some power, but it's not important what the power is. Is equal to the day twist around the boundary component. And there's a different power, alpha to G, to a different power, is also equal to um, the day twist around the boundary component. So now let's call this guy X and this guy Y. And notice, notice that X. Uh, X, Y inverse is T alpha one. So I can get a single day twist as a product of roots of the day twist, a single separating day twist as a product of roots of the day twist from the value of This is central, so I can conjugate all I like. So, conjugates. of X and Y generate <laughs> the magnet class group and every conjugate of X and Y are roots. <laughs> every conjugate is a root. That's, that's how the whole proof goes. <laughs> I mean, embarrassing the elementary is not fair. There's a lot of like actual theorems going on in the background that we're just placing together. Okay. It's just not how I don't get more power in point. It's usually 2G plus 2. It's just into the chain relation. Um, yeah. And then this is just 2G, but it's not important. It's just that it's, there is some power. Okay. Yeah. So for QI, XY inverse, the alpha Y inverse? Yeah. Or on CV. XY is all the I that I make a say there. Yeah, it should be. Sorry, oh, it's the Y X inverse. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, and that's that's the proof of the main theorem, right? You can run this argument. So there are similar relations um, when you have two bad components, and you can actually get the theorem that. If you have two bad components, a product of both the Twitter and the bad components is called final in every other, in every uh, mapping class, every left ordering of the mapping class group. Uh, and here is a question. Those are facts. Good. Okay. Here's a question, um, which I'm not going to answer because I don't have the answer to. So it's just open. So a question is something similar true for more than one boundary component. Cool. I love the question for you to think about. Okay, let's talk about some nice corollaries. Fun little corollaries that come out of all this. So we're going to put together K man and Maxine Wolf's result with this result, and then we spit out some nice with some little corollaries, which come for free almost. So let me remind you of some stuff before we do that. So suppose you take this is a left ordered, so a left ordered group. Left ordered group Z in G is positive cofinal and central. It's central. Actually, it doesn't even have to be positive. Forget that. Cofinal and central. Right. Then the translation number, right? The translation number of an element of a uh, little G in G. Is uh, with respect to disordering, right? It's the limit as k goes to infinity of one on k times the floor with respect to an ordering of g to the k. Okay. And I'll remind you what the floor is. Just turns out to be the same. Um, well, turns out to be the same. Um, Translation number you get from dynamics once you conjugate it to homeo Oh no, wrong one. Disaster. Floor of an element is the unique, unique n such that z to the n is less than, or equal to g is less than z to the n plus one. And actually, now that I write this down, I do want this to be positive. Okay. Great. So here are some corollaries of the main theorem combined with uh, KD and Maxine just often combined with uh, Mandelwolf. Those are weird. So for every left ordering, LO's. On the mapping class group, where the day twist the day twist around a boundary component is positive, right? With your day twist uh, positive, oh, and I guess something like that. Um, then the translation number is independent. The translation number of any element. Translation number. Well, and in the mapping class. So the translation number is somehow an intrinsic property of the group element. It doesn't depend on your left ordering. Really, this is just a man mapping box, and then you've got to check some things about automorphisms of mapping clusters, and they're all inner, so everything's fine. But you have to make sure that it's true. That's a count for free, which is what we thought it did when we started. Okay. Um, one little corollary, and even better. So this number, this translation number, is somehow a number that gets handed to you now for any element of mapping class. What is that number? It turns out to be exactly equal to the fractional dangerous coefficient. So, um, if you know what that is, so this is a fractional dangerous coefficient of f. Um, some fractional data uh, coefficient, uh, and the reason we can say this is because Tsuya Ito and uh, Kawamura 
They prove this is true for a particular order. Prove this for a particular order. So they prove it for one order, and we show it's just the same for every single order. Surprising to me, at least, is that this tells me that the translation number of any element is always rational. So the fractional dangerous coefficients are, as the name suggests, rational. Uh, they're always rational numbers, and it turns out that this is true, which is kind of great. Uh, okay. <laughs> So translating this into actions on R. <clears throat> so every injection of the mapping class group of a surface or boundary of omega plus R um, is conjugate into omega plus S tilde. S1 tilde. Right, so this is all the homeomorphisms that commute the translation by one. Where um, so you might have to conjugate, you might have to change the orientation on R to get what I'm about to say, right? Where um, the Dane twist um, exactly is the translation by one. Right? So since it's always co-final, you can do this. Uh, it's conjugate to here. Um, and the translation number and the translation number of any element of um, the class group is independent of your own um, representation of the uh, yeah, That's what this is saying. That every representation you did the same dynamic order. Yeah. Well, at least when you, at least if you're concerned with translation number. Great. When you question to prepare them. What's, what's that last symbol there, row? Yeah, so row is a, oh, I, I meant to write it as a representation row. Okay, sorry. Yeah, row is a representation. So uh, the result implies that every net ordering on the mapping class group comes from the net ordering on the mode class, uh, sorry, the mode class S1 to the From Homeo plus S1 to the, yeah, there is an embedding into here, and then we can, we can look at the, or like, I mean, you can recover the left over Fixing the, of course, fixing the human motivation from the group. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So I will say fix uh, representation from X to mapping class group to human plus X1 tilde. So that's with, with this property. Yes, we yeah. do. Then so yeah. that every left order from, from the left class group from, from, from a left order from yeah. human class. That's exactly what you should say. Yeah. You could conjugate into this and then you can extract the information. Any other questions? Maybe uh maybe you said it, but I, I didn't catch it. So uh any two of the any two set representations that can conjugate. Um sorry, what do you mean by every conjugate on it's how you plus R you really need? so once I conjugate it's you have actions on Homeo plus X1. There's a notion of first. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I mean, the answer is probably yes, but uh, someone who knows things about what's it with every kind you can see on R will say that has to be a bit of our representations. So follow them and decide to because it's different for the bodies. I definitely, I'm a quick answer your question, but I'm not familiar with the notion of something you can see on R. Uh, I this is corner of the room. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. <laughs> you can't spell it. That statement for the same conjugate. Otherwise, it's not true. And I, well, because it's central and co final, no, if I take it that way. Yeah, but it's the same. You can have a reaction that is not necessarily in the fields. So because this is always called final, the like okay, it's talking okay. into okay. right? Like because this this element has to act now fixed point because it's okay. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> what about big mapping class? Yeah, great question. Yeah. <laughs> what about big mapping class? So there is uh the guys sitting right in front of you here talking about the special class talk. So there is a uh, um 
heading down the next signal is type result for specifically the plane minus the canvas. So the plane minus the canvas has one isolated function. You can play the standard, take the conical cover, like we did before, and all of those actions are to be part of um, up to choosing sign. And um, it was just pointed out to me that you can probably make some arguments to show that because map and class groups of um, all the things, specifically the plane minus the canvas set is generated by two torsion. Probably make an argument to say that when you lift to the this minus the canvas set, that that data surrounded boundary is generated by roots. Well, yeah, it's generated by roots of the data. Uh, taking lifts of those two torsion and then you should be able to recover the same result at least for a play minus k. Which I think is very nice. Yeah, I think it's totally about yeah. writing. It, it, I would like this to be triple of the rain take a big take a big surface with one isolated puncture. That's certainly audible. We know this in act on the conical cover. Um I don't know that all the actions are aesthetic conjugate. It could be nice if they were. And I don't know if we're going to take a central extension. You know, the roots of the data is generated. It'd be nice if it did. Yeah. Be a very nice full picture. Be nice, most useful. All righty. Well, thanks again. Thank